Well, our reading this morning comes from Psalm 25. We'll be reading verses 1 through 10. It's Psalm 25, a psalm of David, beginning in verse 1. David writes these words. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble His way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep His covenant and His decrees. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, I love the honesty of the Bible. The prayers found in the book of Psalms are not all testimonies of great faith and steadfast hope. They are honest reflections about the ups and downs of life. Whether you feel joy or sorrow, faith or doubt, there are prayers in the Bible written for you. And today, we find a psalmist who is tired, anxious, and stressed. And since I know that hosting all the family at your house for Thanksgiving or visiting the in-laws is one of the most relaxing experiences of your life, this may be a difficult sermon to relate to. And so I invite you today to use your imagination and just pretend. What is it like? What do you feel like when you're tired and you're stressed? What was the last time that you felt you were at the end of your rope? David is feeling pressure from all sides as he composes Psalm 25. Not only does he ask God for deliverance from people attacking him, undermining his success, but he's also experiencing his own self-critical spirit. He's aware of his personal failings. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions, he prays. It's one thing to experience the accusations and the criticisms of co-workers and friends when they're completely off base. It's another thing entirely when they strike upon our insecurities or anxieties. It's the words spoken to the working mom that she's not doing enough for her kids. The unemployed man who is told he just simply needs to try harder even after his hundredth application is denied. When the words of others strike upon a part of ourselves that we are already self-conscious about, it's like a poison being released into our veins. So David prays to God, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, and you I trust. The image of David lifting up his soul to God, it recalls the way sacrifices were lifted up to God in the temple in Jerusalem. 
David is offering his life in humility because he realizes he can't get through his present challenges on his own. As one scholar writes, to offer one's life to God means to trust God amid threatening circumstances. David becomes vulnerable before God admitting his own personal failings, and he's doing his best to open himself up to the activity of God in his life. As is always the case, faith and hope are inseparable. By placing his faith in God, by trusting that God will take care of him, David is choosing to live with hope. He's choosing to believe that God desires for him to experience deep joy in life and that God will work to make that possible. David's prayer, it's a model of living that is increasingly difficult to understand and appreciate in our culture. We live in a society that has long prized self-reliance as one of its highest virtues. We idolize leaders in business and politics who seem to achieve success by sheer force of will, who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. But this is not the prayer of David. Instead of relying on himself or his own personal resources, David depends on God. He trusts God to be his refuge in times of trouble, his security in times of confusion. What a countercultural way to live. It, it almost seems a bit foolish for me to stand in front of you this morning and suggest that you should rely on God. Those words seem trite, like something fitting for the front cover of a Hallmark card and then a Sunday sermon. I mean, if you lived in Northern Virginia for any amount of time, you might be wondering right now the usefulness of this. We are an achievement-driven people. And so you might think that unless God is going to show up to work tomorrow and write that contract for you or take the kids to all the sports practices, perhaps I should find a more useful sermon and rely on God. But it's for these reasons and many more I actually think David's prayer is quite fitting. And every day I see more and more articles being published about the damaging effects of our performance-driven culture. We are a nation of perfectionists, and no one knows this better than our youth. Uh, now, if your kids have long graduated high school or college, I need to tell you this morning that the world has changed a bit. Uh, when I was growing up, my mother told me that I should work hard in my studies, but I should also make room to enjoy life, to have some fun. In uh, early high school, when I was still playing basketball, we had a conversation about whether or not I should take a group of advanced placement courses. Now, I was already in some honors classes and a couple advanced classes, and so my mother suggested uh, that I not take the AP classes so that I wouldn't overload myself academically and athletically, a healthy Balance is what she advocated. And although I made good grades in high school and went to a great university, that kind of advice from my mom would get her kicked off the PTA board at James Madison High School. We have conditioned parents and students to believe that high school should be conquered like a decathlon. Our youth are told that they should enroll in every AP class possible and they should get straight A's. Uh, they should play on an athletic team, which they should captain and win multiple awards for. 
They should uh, serve on the leadership team of at least one extracurricular activity, preferably one that demonstrates a concern for cultural diversity or helping the disadvantaged. Uh, and they should earn uh, more community service hours than are required, preferably at their church. Now, where in the midst of all of that you find the time to be a teenager, I'm not really sure. Now, this litany is long and extensive, but try being a parent to one of these youth. Because the need to achieve and accomplish more and more with the same few hours in a day doesn't end when you graduate. Julia Hartley Brewer, a journalist for the Huffington Post, describes the unrealistic expectations for the ideal woman. She writes, She's probably got a high-flying career, a happy marriage to a handsome and very successful man, with two beautiful children, and she's also drop-dead gorgeous with a size 10 figure into the bargain. All of this is in addition to raising the aforementioned children who have the highest GPA possible, are star athletes and model citizens. There you have it. Now, the list of these demands for both adults and youth is exhausting just to read, let alone feel like you need to accomplish every day. Now, I can read all this, but I admit that I am uh, not immune to perfectionism. Uh, the uh, fancy new uh, connections card you have in your bulletin. Uh, this was printed five times before I felt the spacing was correct, four times before I was pleased with the font, and three times before I liked the color scheme. So be thankful you are not on the worship planning team. Welcome to my madness. Now, <laughs> all of us in the midst uh, of this we have to learn that perfectionism leads us to believe that we are only as good as what we do. Our value is not in who we are. And we fear risk and failure because any failure means that we ourselves are failures. But this is a tragic lie we've been conditioned to believe. In reality, a healthy and balanced life comes from recognizing our own limitations. We must accept that we are not infinite super beings who do not need regular rest, relaxation, and time to recharge. We cannot do and accomplish everything imaginable perfectly. And that's all right. David's turn in our reading for today from despair to hope comes precisely at that moment when he is honest about his limitations. Over and over again, you will notice he asks God to lead him in the way. The word way here, it connotes way of life or lifestyle. Uh, David is not asking God for directions to the nearest safe way. He's asking God to teach him a new way of living because his current way of life is not working. David is stressed, he's anxious, and he knows that simply trying harder is not going to make things any better. The future is not within his control, and even his present circumstances are beyond his ability to effectively manage. And it's at this moment, realizing what he can and cannot control, that he opens himself up to God. David is pursuing a new lifestyle that is based upon trusting God trusting that God wants the best for David's life and wants David to experience great joy and peace. Uh, this trust is the foundation for his hope for a new future, his belief that a different way of living is possible. Now, Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann puts it this way, humanness 
is pervasively hope-filled. Not in the sense of a buoyant, unreflective optimism, but in a conviction that individual human destiny is powerfully presided over by this one who wills good and works that good. God is not instrumental to the hope of Israel. God is, in fact, the very substance of that hope. David is not choosing to rely on himself for hope and fulfillment. He's choosing to rely on God. This is not a prayer for instant gratification. He is trusting that by waiting on God, he will experience the fullness of life. It's not a prayer about pursuing what he wants, but pursuing what God wants for his life. And David comes to realize that there are many things in his life he cannot control or perfect, but this realization doesn't lead him to anxious despair. Instead, he recognizes that where he ends, faith begins. David may not be able to control the universe, but God can. And God, as David confesses, is filled with steadfast love and faithfulness. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 8, we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. David asked God to teach him, to lead him into a new way of living. He humbly accepts his own limitations and opens himself up to God's direction, and in this way, David frees himself from stress and is able to close his prayer with words of praise. Now, if you've lived in Northern Virginia for far too long, that this sounds a bit like fluffy theology that is not grounded in any way, uh, perhaps you should consider the findings of Stanford social psychologist Carol Dweck. So in the 1980s, uh, Dweck ran a series of studies to determine why some children remain motivated in the face of challenge and others crumbled at the first sign of difficulty. In her studies, uh, she gave children a number of difficult tasks and puzzles that they needed to complete and then carefully, carefully observed how the children responded. Dweck and her team determined that children typically fall into two categories of thinking. Now, the first is the growth mindset, which views success as changeable and dependent on effort. Uh, the second is the fixed mindset, which believes that children have a set level of intelligence and therefore a fixed potential of success. And interestingly, those with the fixed mindset, when they came across problems that they couldn't solve, they not only couldn't solve those problems, but suddenly they could no longer solve the problems they had completed previously. And some children were so paralyzed at, by the failure that they couldn't recover the ability to solve old problems or new ones for days. Now, fortunately, for the children in this study and for all of us, uh, Dweck and other researchers found that children could switch over from the fixed mindset to the growth mindset. All they had to do was to set certain expectations from the beginning. That meant telling children ahead of time that they would be encountering a difficult challenge. It would be a tough exercise. They would make mistakes. They'd feel confused or even dumb at times. But that they would learn a lot of useful things in the process. And it was only the children who trained themselves not to blame themselves or to internalize the shame of having difficulty that were ultimately able to overcome challenges. To see failure not as something personal, but as an opportunity to succeed. Today, 
we have to develop a healthy sense of our own limitations. Uh, very simply, we must develop the courage to be imperfect, the willingness to confess to God and others that we don't get everything right all the time, that we make mistakes. It's in that moment, genuine authenticity and vulnerability, that we begin to form powerful connections with God and those around us. Uh, we learn that God is filled with steadfast love and faithfulness. We learn to trust that God's grace covers all imperfections. That we are loved for just who we are. We learn where we end, faith begins, and that is a spiritual exercise. As the Psalms reveal that David was human and imperfect like the rest of us, and that's okay. God doesn't fault David for that. Instead, God invites David and invites you to follow in a way of learning and growth. A lifestyle that teaches us when it's time to let go and let God handle things. A way of life that calls us to rest and renewal so that we may discover new hope and faith. May we follow God's leading on the way. Amen.